All right, time to wrap up our discussion of the cosmological argument. So what are some objections to the cosmological argument? Well, the first is uh, the same thing we said in response to the teleological argument. It doesn't get us the Christian conception of God. It doesn't get us an all-powerful creator, an all-knowing creator, an all-good creator, an eternal uh, being. A self it does get us a self-existent being. But that's it, right? It doesn't get us any of those other things. It only establishes the existence of a self-existent being. Once again, this isn't to destroy the argument, though. It's just to say that the argument doesn't go as far as many have claimed it does. Right? So people in the past have said, look, the cosmolo cosmological argument proves the existence of God. Well, no, not quite. It proves the existence of a self-existent being. We need to do a lot of other work in order to prove that that self-existent being is also perfectly powerful, knowledgeable, and good. You could have a being that's self-existent, which fails to be perfect in those other respects. So, we still need more arguments if we want to get to the full Christian conception of God. But if we can prove that a self-existent being exists, that's still important, right? That's still a great step forward. Uh, so, the first objection is really just to notice what your conclusion is saying, right? It's not as strong as proving the existence of God, just some self-existent being. Okay, but that's not the main objection to the cosmological argument. Remember, I said the cosmological argument's premises depend on the principle of sufficient reason. And the principle of sufficient reason, just to remind you, claims that there must be an explanation for the existence of any being and any positive fact. So if there's something that exists, whether it's a being or a fact, right, there's an explanation for why it exists. There has to be an explanation for why it exists. And that's why we say, well, not everything can be dependent because we need something to explain why that chain of dependent beings exists. Right? There has to be an explanation for why that chain of beings exists. Um, good. So if you could doubt PSR, or the principle of sufficient reason, I'm going to just say PSR from now on. If you can doubt the truth of PSR, then you don't need that same explanation for the chain of infinite beings, right? If not everything has to have an explanation, we can just say, hey, look, that infinite set of beings just exists. There doesn't have to be an explanation there. And then the whole force of the argument collapses, right? Uh, then we don't need premise two that not every being could be dependent because it's false then. It could be true that uh, every being is simply dependent and we don't need an explanation for why that chain of beings exists. So hopefully you see the very strong connection between the argument and PSR. If we accept PSR, the argument seems pretty strong, but... As you might have guessed, there are some reasons to doubt the truth of the principle of sufficient reason. So the first, and although none of these are knockdown arguments, there are reasons to doubt the principle. So first, there's four reasons. First, is that it claims there can be no brute facts. And what do I mean by brute facts? Just the fundamental fact. Right? So imagine what physics is trying to do. The goal of modern physics is to explain the existence of everything and then go and trace all the way back to whatever the fundamental object is, the fundamental particle or wave, whatever it is, uh, that nothing else can be sort of said afterwards. Right? So once we find this particle or wave, uh, we found the bedrock, we found the foundation of our physical world, right? And there's no more explaining why that exists. We get there and we say, why does that exist? That question doesn't make sense anymore. It's just a brute fact, right? That's where things begin. But PSR says that we can't have brute facts like this, right? Uh, so one reason to doubt the truth of PSR is because it seems to go against the grain uh, of the goal of modern physics. And we 
had a lot of success with modern physics. Uh, we think it's a valuable practice. And PSR would be saying, hey, your goal really isn't that valuable. There would still have to be an explanation. So you'll never find a fundamental particle. You'll never find whatever the foundation is, right? So even if it goes beyond particles and waves, and there's something else that explains the origin of the universe, you'll still have to explain why that thing exists, right? We can never hit bottom if PSR is true. Good, so that's some reason to doubt it. Uh, it seems to go against what we're doing in physics. Second, it's not clear how, remember we said self-existence is really difficult to explain. And it's not clear how self-existence of God or self-caused things are any different from brute unexplained facts. Right, so here's here's the two responses, right? Hey, how do you explain that? Well, if you believe in brute facts, you just say, that's the end. That's the end of explanation. We found the fundamental truth. That's it. Okay. If we appeal to the self-existent camp, they'll say, well, we have this fundamental thing, and then it's explained by itself, right? It's not clear how either of these are substantively different from one another. I mean, one purports to give an explanation in terms of itself instead of just like the brute, camp fa brute fact camp saying there is no explanation. Uh, but... The self-existent camp hasn't given us a very robust notion of how something can depend on itself for existence. And really, it just seems like when we're saying something is self-existent, we're just saying it's a brute fact that that thing exists, and it exists because of itself. Right? Um, so if we think that I'll, we might be able to explain self-existence, ex we might be able to explain self-existence better. But until we can do that, it seems as though self-existence and brute unexplained facts are sort of on the same evidential ground, right? They both seem to not be wholly satisfying. They both don't seem to make a ton of sense. Uh, so if we're going to rule out brute unexplained facts, like the proponent of PSR does, why aren't they also ruling out self-existent facts. Right? Uh, good, so if you believe in PSR, uh, it doesn't seem like you can justify getting rid of brute facts, but keeping self-existent facts. So that's number two. That's the second reason to doubt the truth of PSR. Uh, three and four are closely related. So roughly what's going on here is people who like the principle of sufficient reasoning have given some arguments for why we should think it's true. They don't just say, hey, here's the principle of sufficient reasoning, believe it or you're stupid. Right? They don't say that. They say, hey, here's the principle of sufficient reasoning. It's very plausible because look at what we try and do every day. We try and explain the world around us. Right? So it's plausible that everything would have an explanation, but here are some additional reasons why you might think so. And my plan here is to tell you why both of the common arguments fail. So the first common argument would be some try to claim PSR is true by just saying it's really intuitively true. If you just think about the truth of the statement, everything has an explanation, you'll just see that it's true. Now, they might have to get a little more specific here. They might say if you have the correct sort of philosophical training, then you'll just be able to see by thinking about the terms that PSR is true. Uh, but let's think about why this argument's not very good. One, it depends on you sharing the same intuition that they share, right? that they have. Uh, you might not have that intuition. And it turns out that many able philosophers over the years have thought about the principle of sufficient reason and don't see it as intuitively true. right? So if you're going to make a claim that, hey, we should believe it because it's intuitively true, that needs to be true for the majority of people. Uh, but that just hasn't been the case, right? So, in addition, it doesn't seem like this PSR is true, intuitively true, in the same way as necessary mathematical claims, right? So, uh, here's a claim. 
all triangles have three angles. And if you think about the definition of triangle, you'll just see it's true. Oh yeah, that has three angles, right? That's very intuitively true. It just sort of appears to us when we think about it. Uh, and even if you think PSR is plausible, it's clearly not intuitively true in the same way as our claim about triangles. Okay, and then let's move on to the next argument. Their second argument in favor of the principle of sufficient reason is that they claim it's a presupposition of our reasoning. And so, in other words, we all just assume that PSR is true in order to start thinking about the world. Right? So, we pop into the world and we start trying to explain everything around us. Right? So, even when we're little kids, we start asking why, why, why constantly to our parents to have them explain how these things are working to make sense of the world around us. And the proponent of PSR is going to say that doesn't make sense unless you just assume that there is an explanation for everything, right? So we're just sort of presupposing the truth of PSR when we start inspecting the world. Now, we should grant, like, this might be true, right? We might presuppose PSR. We might use it from the very beginning, and it's how we initially make sense of the world. However, and here's the important part, just because we presuppose something is true and that thing seems to work very well for us, that doesn't mean that we can't reject it later, right? So if PSR has been working, but now we have evidence, maybe that brute facts exist uh, because physics is telling us that, we can inspect our beliefs again later on in life like we do with all of our other beliefs, right? And we inspect our beliefs and see, hey, that presupposition of PSR that I've been using all these years might not actually be true, right? So just because, so here's the overall point. Just because we presuppose something and it works doesn't mean it's true, right? So we can presuppose something and use it for the time being, but if we get evidence later on that it's not true, then we can go back and reject our presupposition. Okay, so let's do a quick summary of the problems for PSR, and then we'll conclude. So first, uh, we have reason to doubt PSR because it says there are no brute facts, and this seems to go against the goal of modern physics. Two, it doesn't seem like there's uh, much better ground for self-existent facts compared to brute facts. So if you're a proponent of the PSR, uh, it seems like if you're going to reject brute facts, you should also reject self-existent facts. Three, some have claimed that PSR is intuitively true, uh, but that's just not the case. Even if it is the case, it's clearly not as intuitively true as something like our claim about triangles having three angles. And then finally, they've claimed that... Uh, PSR is true because it's a presupposition of our reasoning, but just because something's a presupposition of our reasoning doesn't make it true. We can reject it if we get better evidence later on. So, what's the overall point of this lecture? Well, first, the cosmological argument doesn't get us the Christian God, just gets us a self-existent being. And then secondly, the cosmological argument depends on the principle of sufficient reason which we seem to have good reason to doubt. And if we doubt the PSR, then the premises of the cosmological argument don't work anymore. Okay, so hopefully you've enjoyed talking about the cosmo cosmological argument. You see how it works, how it might fall apart, and you see what you need to think about going into the future if you want to defend the cosmological argument. Thank you.